Guess what? Busy doesn't stop a text. So text him. See if you can get through to that, brother. Because he obviously is a Jewish believer who led you to the Lord. My Christian wife led me to know who Jesus was. And, and Pastor Ron, today's a really, really special day for me because on Super Bowl Sunday in 1988, that's the day that I married that beautiful woman. It's my 31-year anniversary. I want you to think bad of me. It's like, man, he's not with his wife for his night of birth. It's all right. Let me explain. She's flying back from Tampa today. She was spending the weekend there, you know, with, with, with some, so, somebody else who was having a birthday. She's flying back from Tampa. We're going we're to celebrate. How are you going to celebrate? Watch the Super Bowl? No. I don't care about the Super Bowl. Let me tell you why I don't care about the Super Bowl. I don't care about the Super Bowl because, first of all, uh, all the commercials are stuff that I don't... I, 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 forget about it. It's so impure. It's absolutely ridiculous. I don't care what team wins. And leading up to the Super Bowl, I believe it was Roger Waters of Pink Floyd who said that, that, that those guys in the halftime show, they should bow to Cap, Colin Kaepernick. And I'm saying, you know what? I don't want to uh, get in the midst of that political stuff. I would love it. I would love it for someone to say, how about we all bow and take a knee for Jesus? It's about time somebody did. Before I get into the message, I have to share a, a, a God moment that I had, and it was only a little bit a little bit less than a month ago. And it eventually we'll get into the message before the rapture. But um about a month ago. Because, see, Pastor Ron, you know, anytime I come here, we eventually get into the message. i got a lot to say before the message comes. So about a month ago, I was on a, a two-week tour in, in the South. I was in Louisiana, Alabama, and Florida. And at the start of my tour in Louisiana, I was speaking in a church, and after the church service, Pastor said, he said, he said, Rabbi, come on out, and when we're going to go to a restaurant, I'll take you to lunch. I said, well, that sounds good. So I'm sitting in a restaurant. Now, mind you, I am in Louisiana. Anybody here from Louisiana? Okay, nobody could, so I can talk about them. All right, so. <laughs> so I'm in out there in the restaurant in Louisiana, and I open up the menu for lunch. And I'm, and, and I'm seeing things like, let's see. Now, mind you, I'm Jewish. Let's see. Okay, so we got shrimp. We got sausage. We got scallops. We got crawfish. And the first thing that comes to my mind is, okay, I'm going to die here. I'm going to starve. <laughs> I'm going to starve. Is it? And the waiter comes over, he says, um, what, what would you like to order? And I said, um, it, could you like just um, bring me a glass of water? And he said, yes. He said, you know, there's a lot on the menu. Would you like anything else? And I said, um, he, he, could, yeah, could you put ice in the water? <laughs> and he said, yes. He said, sir, is there anything else? I said, a lemon for the ice with the water. No, I finally found some on the menu. But, but here's, here's why I'm telling you this story. I'm telling you this story because it was, was one evening there when I was speaking at the church. And I didn't have to get up early the next morning. So I slept late the next morning. And I said, when I got up, I said, you know what, Lord, I want to spend time with you. And I looked out the window of the hotel I was staying in. It was beautiful. It was like 70 degrees, nice breeze, a beautiful, beautiful sunny day. And let me tell you where I was. I was in central Louisiana in a town called Pineville, Pineville, Louisiana. And I said, Lord, I want to go out of the room somewhere and just be with you and spend time with you. And I don't know where yet, but you'll take me there. Now, this area of Louisiana, next to Pineville, Louisiana, there's the Red River. And on the other side of the Red River, there's a town called Alexandria, bigger, bigger town. And I said, I'm going to go over to Alexandria, Louisiana. And because there's a park over there that's right along the Red River where you have the bridge coming over and the tugboats going under. And I said, that's where I need to be. I want to spend some quiet time with the Lord. And so I, I, I went walking along the trail on the Alexandria side and I saw it. This one bench, there's nobody on it, right along the banks overlooking the river, shade trees over it. I said, Lord, that's my spot. And I went there and I sat. And I was just in prayer and getting into the Word for about 10 or 15 minutes. Now listen, 
after that was done, I said, I said, God, I said, I need to ask you something. I said, you know, I would really love if it's your will to hear from you this morning. But Lord, I don't want there to be any doubt in my mind. I, wait, wait, if, if you want to speak to me, I want to know beyond any shadow of a doubt that it's from you so that I don't try to make it up and I don't try to manufacture it. Amen. Because sometimes we do that. Yes. Lord, am I hearing from you? And I heard from the Lord because I know deep in your heart that it's not the case all the time. I said, Father, I, I don't want to be at that place. I want to know it's you beyond any shadow of a doubt. Take me out of the equation. If you do something, let it be from you because I don't want to brag. I don't want to manufacture. That is so not authentic. Lord, that's if you want to speak to me. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm just sitting there on the bench. About three minutes later, three, four minutes later, the cell phone that, that I had in, in my pocket started vibrating, which means that I probably have a call or something else like that. And when I looked on the front of the phone call, it said that, that uh, it, it basically showed me in an email. Now, I'm in Alexandria, Louisiana, Jewish Voices in Phoenix. When somebody calls me at my Jewish Voice office in Phoenix, that their call registers in it as an email to me so that no matter where I am in the world, I could just go into my phone to the email and listen to the actual voicemail message that they left. And so I, I said, I figured, let me do that. So I listened to the message, and the message started off this way. She said, hello, Rabbi Jack. She said, my name is, is Colleen. She said, and, and uh, me and my, uh, actually it's Connie. She said, me and my son... We're in need of some help. Uh, she said, uh, we, we need to take a bus to our next destination. And we ran out of money. And uh, if she said, maybe if Jewish boys could call a Greyhound bus station and just set aside two bus tickets for us, we would really appreciate that. Um, and she said, Rabbi, I hope you, you can help us. She said, and I'm calling from Alexandria, Louisiana. <laughs> Listen, I am never in Alexandria, Louisiana. I never get phone calls from Alexandria, Louisiana. And so right then and there I knew. And I looked at the phone. She didn't leave her phone number. I'm thinking, what do I do? How do I get back to her? But, but her phone number showed up on, on, on my iPhone. And I said, you know, sometimes you could trace a phone number. I took the phone number and I typed it into Google. And it came up with a, the, the name of a hotel that was not three miles away from where I was sitting. <laughs> More than a thousand miles away from home. And I got up from that bench and I said, okay, Lord, let me call her back. I got the number. I know it's a hotel. So I kept calling, calling, calling. Am I just like you? Every time I called the number, hello, I got a busy seat. And I'm thinking, okay, well, let me maybe head on over to that area where the hotel is and eventually I'll get through. So I keep calling the number over and over again. I say, well, nobody's answering. Let me run some errands. I run some errands. I finish the errands. I call again. It's busy. And, and, and about this time, it's almost noontime, and I said, well, you know, I think I'll go to lunch. And, and, and I don't say this, the, these next words often, but it's true here. Because sometimes you can overuse them. Here are the words. And I specifically heard God saying to me, you ain't going to lunch. <laughs> I said, where am I going? He said, you're going to the hotel. He said, if you can't get through, you go drive there. Go to that hotel. And by that point, it was only about a half a mile away. And so I drove to the hotel. I got out of the car, going to the hotel office, and I said, uh, I said, listen, I'm looking for a woman. She's here with her son. Her name is Connie. Can you tell me what room she's staying in? He said, oh, I'm so sorry. You just missed her. She left with her son five minutes ago. I said, how, by car? He said, no, they, they started walking. I said, which way? He said, that way. I said, then I'm going that way. Yeah. So I don't know where they are, but I know that they're walking in a certain direction. And so I get in my car, and I start driving in that direction 
And, and as I'm driving, and I'm driving very slowly, I'm, I'm looking to see if anybody's out there walking. And I see a woman, she looked like she was in her 60s, maybe 70s, with the gentleman next to her who, based upon his age, could qualify as his son. And they're walking in a mall parking lot. And so I, I, I pull into that mall parking lot, my car, I pull in, and, and I get right next to them, and I roll the window down, and I said, I said to the woman, I said, excuse me, ma'am, is your name Connie? And she said, yes. <laughs> and I said, Connie, about an hour ago, did you leave a message for a Rabbi Jack Zimmerman? With Jewish Voice Ministries in Phoenix, Arizona, she said, Yes! I said, Sweetheart, I'm right here. I said, Look, we. We all just can't sit here crying out in the mall parking lot. <laughs> let's, let's go inside. Let's go sit down in a restaurant. Let's go have some lunch and figure this whole thing out. And so the three of us were sitting down for lunch, and, and I said, Connie, what happened? And she said, well, she said, I live in Shreveport, which is about an hour and 40, hour 45 minutes north of Alexandria. And I said, what are you doing here? She said, I took a bus down here because I thought that the Lord was speaking to me. <laughs> and telling me to meet someone here. Oh. And I said, well, <laughs> maybe you have. I said, so, she said, I, and, and, but I just, uh, my son and I, and he was like developmentally disabled and, and just, just sweet, sweet folks. She said, we just need to take the bus and get home. I said, Connie, I'll take care of the bus for you. I said, let me go on my phone online and see what the bus schedule is. And I looked, and I said, well, Connie, I got good news, bad news. I said, the good news is that there is a bus today leaving from here in Alexandria to go to Shreveport. I said, that's the good news. The bad news is, Connie, it's lunchtime right now. It's about noon. That bus is only one bus per day. It doesn't leave until about 10 o'clock tonight. And I, I said, have you and your son already checked out of the hotel? She said, yes. I said, I don't want you and your son roaming the streets for 10 hours. That's ridiculous. I said, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to bring you and, son, you and your son back to the hotel. We're going to put you up for another night. Tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning, you be in the hotel office. I'm driving up. I'm coming to get you. We're all driving to Shreveport. And we did. Yeah. When it's a God thing, you know it. Yeah. Amen. You don't have to doubt. So if you're ever in that position where you say, God, was that you or not? If you have to ask, it probably was not. Because if God wants you to know that it's him, you will know that. once said to me, you know, said, said, Rabbi, don't you know, God is trying to talk to you. I'm like, no, he's not. I said, what do you mean? I said, no, God is not trying to talk to me. I said, what are you talking about? I said, God doesn't have to try to do anything. God does not have to make an attempt to do something. When God decides that he wants to do it, he just does it. He doesn't have to. Sometimes we don't have our ears open here. That's right. That's right. But God doesn't have to try. No. And maybe, maybe, he's talking to you today. I am so blessed because at the beginning of this service, Pastor said, we, and, and several of us have been talking about salvation. Yes. Could it be, and I believe it is, that this is the day that the Lord has made. Yes. Yes. You know it's traditional. Let me, let me explain what tradition is. There's nothing wrong with tradition as long as it points to Christ. Amen. But Jesus, when Jesus spoke against tradition, and he said, listen, your traditions make null and void the word of God, that's because people were adhering to traditions instead of adhering to his word. That's the problem. Let me tell you what tradition is. And pastor, you know this. Many of you know this. The tradition is when you go to a church service, 
They hear the praise and worship, and there's prayer, and sometimes there's communion, praise the Lord, somebody gets up to speak, and at the end of the message, they give an altar call, and that's tradition, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. But here's the deal. I'm flipping tradition on its head this morning. I'm kidding. Amen. Uh -huh. Amen. And so what I'm saying is, is, if you have already been moved by this service, you don't have to wait till the end of my message, because eventually I'm going to give it, but you don't have to wait till the end of my message to ask Christ Jesus into your life. You don't have to wait. So I, I'm telling you that because I'm going to do something else that I've never done before. Yes, I've got a message, and yes, I've got a teaching, and yes, we're going to talk about Israel, but here's the deal. If anywhere in the midst of that message or that, te or, or that teaching, God has touched you, and you have come to the point of where you want to accept him right then and there, right. I, you raise your hand, you yeah. interrupt that message. I don't yeah. care, because your salvation is more important than PowerPoint yeah. slides. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Then that's what we're doing. Yeah. Now we can put the slides up. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. The message this morning, I want to fill you in on the latest in Israel. Or the latest from Israel. Every February, I have the blessing of coming here. And uh, last February, I came here. And, and since that time, I've been to Israel twice. And I, I, I go there each year and I lead tours to the Holy Land. And in fact, in a little over a month, I'm going back there again. By the way, by the way, if you, and I say this every time I come, if you have not yet had the opportunity to go to Israel, commit it to prayer, get two less Starbucks Frappuccinos during the week, put the money away and save it, and you eventually will be able to go. It is a certainty. And I want you to be able to go in that. Not, not, I, look, I don't want you to go saying, well, I need to go to Israel because a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi came from Phoenix and he said, go. No. No. Go to Israel because you will find in a greater way Jesus in all of his glory Amen. and in all of your faith. Amen. Ladies from, from Israel, first of all, let's go on to the next slide. And here in our next slide, I want to start off with this prophecy. And I want to start off with the prophecy because, uh, uh, how do you know the Bible is true? Easy. When our God makes a promise, he keeps it. Amen. And no other holy book does that. Amen. And so I, I picked this prophecy because this is a prophecy where, listen, we got proof of all prophecies. I got pictures that this prophecy is true. Can you imagine somebody showing you pictures or photos of how God made a prophecy and then fulfilled it. Imagine getting evidence on film. <laughs> Let me read the prophecy to you first. This is about 2,600 years ago. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 1. It says, The desert and the dry land will be glad. The Aravah. By the way, since you got the rabbi here, you want to learn a little bit of Hebrew today? Yes. yes. Okay, there's five people. That's right. <laughs> Man, since you got the rabbi here, you want to learn a little bit of Hebrew today? Yeah. All right. The Hebrew word, everybody say, Aravah. Aravah. See, now you just doubled your knowledge of Hebrew because y'all knew Shalom. Now you know Aravah. You just doubled your Hebrew proficiency. That's nice. And the word Aravah means wilderness. So what Isaiah is really saying here, the desert and the dry land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the lily. Simple translation. God is saying, listen, there's going to come a day where the deserts of Israel, where nothing grows and it's parched and everything, I'm telling you, flowers and trees and fruits are going to grow on that land. Now, let me show you how this prophecy was fulfilled. I got proof. Let's go on to the first slide. So here is the Arava, or the wilderness of Israel, in 1948. Or... Interstate 10, 20 miles west of Yuma, 2019. <laughs> Listen, I'm a rabbi. I can't lie. Come on. <laughs> anyway, that's what the wilderness looked like some 70 years ago. God said, I'm going to take that wilderness. I'm going to make that desert. That, that, I'm going to make it bloom. 
When our God makes a promise, He keeps it. Check it out now. Boom! There it is! You want proof that the Bible is true? You just got it! You just got it. Israel is the land and the place where prophecy is fulfilled. When God makes a promise, He will never let you down. He always delivers on it. Always. So, this past year, 2018, big, big year for the nation of Israel, and that also means it was a big, big year for all of us. Why? Because what happens in Israel affects us. Amen. Why? Because if you want to know what time it is, throw your watch away and just look toward the east. That's right. Because, because, well, I love this area so much. Jesus is not coming back to life. Amen. He's coming back to Israel. Amen. That's right. That's right. And this past year, a lot of major events. Let's go on to the first one. Let me show you. Here's the, here's the first one. The U.S. Embassy opened in Jerusalem. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, 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 people got all excited. And some of you are probably wondering, okay, wait a minute. So, a building opens, the United States opens a city, uh, opens an embassy in Jerusalem. Okay, so what's the big deal? Well, let me give you a little bit of background. Let me go on to the next slide. Here in our next slide, this was the U.S. Embassy in Israel. Uh, since 1966, this building has been in Israel in the city of Tel Aviv, Israel. Now, Tel Aviv is a beautiful city right along the Mediterranean Sea. It is not the capital city, but it, 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 it's, it's a big city. And for the longest time, the United States has had an embassy, their embassy building here in Tel Aviv. By the way, what was really cool is last year when I went to Israel, and I didn't even know this because I had never been to a building before, but I'll show you something. You see this over here, this other building right over here to the right of the embassy? Okay, that's the Orchid Hotel. That's actually where I stayed. And I didn't even know. I mean, I booked the hotel. I just knew it was in Tel Aviv. And so every morning I would get out of my hotel and walk past this building. And I would walk past the building. I would pray. And I would say, thank you, Lord. And I would look at the building and say, your time is up. Yes. <laughs> because, because this U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv, a promise was made that the, the U.S. Embassy would now open up in Jerusalem. Now, Let's go on to our next slide. And let me show you something here. It would open up in Jerusalem because in 1995, Congress had passed what was called the Jerusalem Embassy Act. And, and that said that the United States Embassy, now listen to this, this is 1995. So this is what, like uh, 24, almost 25 years ago. 1995, Congress said the United States Embassy should be established in Jerusalem by 1999. <coughs> now I know, and you know that the wheels of government turn slowly, but this is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Congress said open up an embassy in Jerusalem in 1999. How come it took all the way until last year for it to finally happen? Here's why. Every six months, the sitting president of the United States would have a letter put on his desk. And that letter would essentially say, Mr. President, uh, if for any reason you don't want this embassy to move, sign this letter and we'll postpone it for another six months. Let's go on to the next slide. And each one of these guys did. They got the letter and they basically said in the letter that, that uh, uh, they, if they signed the letter, here's what the letter said, I hereby determine it's necessary in order to protect the national security interests of the United States, to spend, suspend for six months the limitations set forth in sections 3B, 7B, la 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 la, the Jerusalem Embassy Act. So each of these presidents signed the letter holding up the move of the embassy. And in President Trump's first six months of office, he signed this letter as well. He said, we can't move it. We, we, we have to consider the national security interests of our country. What is the big deal? Well, the big deal was, see, if, if you move an embassy from Tel Aviv uh, to the capital of Jerusalem, well, Jerusalem is a disputed city. And if we move our embassy to Jerusalem, we're going to say Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And we're, we're, man, we're going to get those Palestinians all upset. 
And, and then they're going to get violent because they need a reason to get violent. <laughs> Thank you so much. But anyway, so in his first six months of office, President Trump said, all right, sign the letter, we can't move the embassy. But then six months later, the letter came up again. And here's what happened. Let's go on to our next slide. This time he said, forget the letter. He said, I am hereby directing the State Department to begin preparation to move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good decision. Great decision. Now, people were saying, wow, all right, and, and, you know, they, I'm glad that he's going to do it, but that's probably going to take about 10 years or so. People are thinking, yeah, it takes a while to build a new building. going to be about 10 years. And so let's go on to our next slide. But then at around that same time, Vice President Mike Pence went to visit Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and he said, Mr. Prime Minister, our administration will advance its plan to open the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem and the embassy will open before the end of 2019. Now, if something's supposed to take about 10 years and you're able to do it in a little more than one year, how are you able to do that? I mean, look, I, I mean, there are construction projects, but you're talking about people drinking a lot of caffeine to get some building done in that. But they said, wait a minute. No, here's what we're going to do. They said, we're not going to build a new building. See, in Jerusalem, the United States has had an American consulate there. It hasn't been the embassy. So why don't we just do this? Just change the sign on the outside. <laughs> we don't have to build a new building. Just change it from consulate to embassy of the United States of America. And it's exactly what they did. Exactly what they did. Now, let's go on to our next slide, because when this happened, people went absolutely out of their minds. I was in Israel at the time. I was in Jerusalem when the embassy was being dedicated, and it was at the end of our tour, and I, uh, we had someone on our staff. Her, her name is Tamar, and she lives in Israel, and I said, Tamar, I need, uh, I need a lift to Tel Aviv. Could you drive me to Tel Aviv? She said, sure. I said, could we stop off at the new embassy here in Jerusalem on the way? She said, sure. <laughs> so we began driving to the embassy and listening the Israelis were very, very excited about the decision. So they started putting up these banners all over the place. So we passed this banner. Here's another one. There, there's another banner. But listen, here's what you need to know about Israelis. When Israelis do something, they do something big. So people are looking at that banner and Israel say, you know, that's not big enough. We need to make it a little bigger. So then they did this. Boom. <laughs> And then after that, they said, that's good, but not quite. And so then they did this. Boom. Oh, Lord. <laughs> all these embassies all up, you know, and, and just excited about the embassy. By the way, where this building is located, see this one right over here with the fence? That's where the new embassy is. So that when, when the embassy was being dedicated, people were coming in, they could see that banner over there. And so we're driving over to the embassy. Here's the next slide as we're driving over. Look at that. That's something that Jerusalem never had before. A sign that said you have sent the And so as we're driving, we drive up now this road. And there's a circular drive right in front of the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem. And I took a picture. And I got it. I want you to see it. Here it is. Next slide. Boom. There it is. So here the, the embassy in Jerusalem has been open maybe, maybe for two days. And already it's active. You've got people coming in and going out. You've got a family over there, the kids with the stroller. And if you're looking at the picture, you're probably saying, oh, yeah, Rabbi Jack, here's the question. What, why y'all got windshield wipers in the picture? And part of the dashboard is that, well, Jesus did away with the law. Be careful. The penalty of the law is dead, but the principle of the law is eternal. Because the law itself said the only way you're going to be saved is through shed blood sacrifice. That principle is eternal. It's just not by goats and rams anymore. Is it Jesus doing it? This Bible takes those idiosyncrasies into account. And in Romans 10.4, what it really says is, for Messiah is the goal of the Torah, or the goal of the law. In other words, the law, the role of the law, was to point you to Jesus in the first place. That's why Paul called it a tutor. Very, very powerful in here. Uh, this also I didn't have last time. This is a sun catcher. Let me see. Can I put this in front? Oh, yeah, yeah. This over here, this is the Star of Israel. It is the Hebrew word Shalom, and it looks even greater when the sun hits it. And uh, you can put it outside your house. It says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem from Psalm 122.6. And finally, 
I have two mezuzas <laughs> this morning. It's not a medusa. That's a girl with the snakes in her hair. Like I say every time I come, we don't sell that one anymore. <laughs> this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, where God says, Write my words on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. How do you do that? You got God's word in here in the Hebrew. You have a hole on the top, a hole on the bottom. Put it on the right side of your door. Hammer a nail on the top, hammer a nail on the bottom. You got God's word on your door. I got loads of, of these, and I only have one of this one. And this one was, we actually picked it up in Israel. It is a mezuzah. It's got the messianic seal on it. So it's got the lampstand, the star of David, and the fish. And on the top, it has the design of the, the, the priestly breastplate. So that's pretty cool, too. Did y'all learn a little bit this morning? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. But even more than that, even more than that, did we all draw closer to God from yeah. this church yeah. service? Yeah. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to do. Pastor, I'm going to close with the, with the blessing that I always do. And if I haven't already said so, my brother, thank you for having me come back. And, and you know, if, 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 there's only, if it's only one time a year that I could come back, uh, it, it's, this is the kind of service that I'm so glad that I could come back to. Because this is how revival begins. Amen. But we've got a lot to thank the Lord about. Let me send you out with a blessing every time I come. Feel free to stand up and receive it if you want. If you'd like to sit down and be more comfortable, that's fine. It comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. It's the priestly blessing or the Aaronic benediction. I will say it over you first in English. Then I will sing it over you in Hebrew. And after I close in Hebrew, give me about five or ten seconds head start to get to the materials table out there so I can take your cards or just shake your hand and give you a hug and thank you for coming today and for each and every one who has. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. May the Lord our God lift up his countenance upon you. And may he grant you his peace. And sung in the Hebrew it sounds this way. <speaking in Hebrew>
And uh, the Lord says, don't get angry. You put up a flag. Amen. 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 And so uh, Brother Larry came and brought his cane, crane, and we lifted that flag with the American flag and the Israeli flag. Well, I'll tell you what it was. It was a Confederate flag. I don't like Confederate flags. I don't like what they represent. I think they lost the war anyway, didn't they? But the Lord said, you put up a flag. Guess what? Go behind the church and look to the right. You won't see the Confederate flag in there. That's what I'm God that we said. You have a problem with God. Right. Because God made each and every one of us in his image. Amen. If you cut yourself, we all bleed red. Amen. Amen. When we get to heaven, you're going to see people from every nation, from every tongue, yes. and from every color. Amen. 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 And I want you to always reflect heaven. So if you don't come with people that don't look like you, you're in the wrong place. Amen. Amen. Yes. Glory! We used to look. Yeah. Amen. 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 I don't ever want to be in a church where everybody looks alike. I'm glad God is not born. Amen. 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 How come out we all look alike? Yeah. Huh? Yes. God knows what He's doing, huh? Yes. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. It's always a time to share that. I remember, I remember coming there when we first came in, in the church. Everybody, the church did not look like this. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Matter of fact, Pastor. Pastor was told that God was going to bring a black man. And he almost freaked out on that. <laughs> black man in every bird, you must be lost in what they say. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. Yes. Because God knows my heart. Yes. God knows I love you and I'm going to tell you the truth. Yes. Yes. And we are, not, we, are, we are all alike in the eyes of God. Yes. Amen. 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 I don't care who you are, color your skin, what you have and don't have. We are all alike uh, in the yes. eyes yes. of God. Yes. Yes. So come back. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yeah. I say come back. Yeah. 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 Turn around and hug somebody's neck and love somebody this morning. Yeah. Hug somebody's neck. Hug your wife. Thank you. 